Let's turn in our Bibles to two passages now for our morning scripture, first from Isaiah chapter 6, and then I shall read from Luke chapter 7. As we turn to God's Word, let us stand for the reading of it. Isaiah chapter 6, I shall read verses 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty." And then from Luke's gospel, chapter 7, verses 36 through 40. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. She bought an alabaster, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, though the man hadn't spoken out loud. Jesus answered him, Simon I have something to tell you. Say on, teacher, he said. May God bless the reading of his scripture. May we be seated for prayer. And now, O holy God, Thou who art the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Thou who art the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to You not because we are worthy, nor because it makes us comfortable, but because You bid us come. And we would first praise Your name, we would tell you that we love you. We would tell you that we want to be disciples of yours. And Father, we want to talk to you about our friends today. For there are some who are ill. There are others who walk in darkness. There are those who need your strength. We lift them up to you knowing that you do all things well. And knowing that if it is in your plan, you will give us 
the deepest desires of our hearts. And Lord, we come to you this morning to ask for your help and guidance in our lives for decisions that each of us need to make daily, for decisions that this church faces. And Father, we come before you to ask for forgiveness for our sins are many. And we know that we are not worthy to stand before you. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we ask for forgiveness. So, Lord, pick us up, dust us off, and set us on the road to your kingdom. We do ask it in the name of Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. You may have noticed that several of the songs that we've been singing this morning deal with talking with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. You know, sometime back, the Gallup poll folks, they are, I suppose, the oldest and most reputable of the polling companies in America. They, they did a survey of a selected group of Americans and what they asked them to do is rather interesting. They gave them a list and asked them to choose one of these eight names as the person with whom they would most like to spend an afternoon in conversation. Think about that. The person with whom you would like most to spend an afternoon sitting there and talking. Well, it really wasn't surprising that three-fourths of the Christians, Protestants, uh, Catholics, three-fourths of the Christians said they'd like to spend an afternoon in conversation with Jesus. That's not surprising, unless it's surprising that only three-fourths. But what was surprising is that a third of those people who said they're unbelievers a third of them chose Jesus as the person from this list that they'd most like to spend an afternoon in conversation with. Hmm. Well, looking at the list, uh, Abraham Lincoln came in second. The poll folks said probably the Protestants chose him. George Washington came in third, and probably, you know, the high church folks, the Catholics got him in the running. And then Leonardo closely beat out John Wayne for fourth place by a brushstroke probably, Da Vinci won. And so then came Cleopatra of Egypt for number sixth place. Her beauty must have been fading fast. And number seven was Joan of Arc who couldn't stand the heat. And then tail end of the line is Napoleon, who was accustomed to being first in most things. You know, I looked at that, that survey, and I thought to myself, what are these people thinking of? Do they think that to sit down with Jesus is like going to the mall at Christmas time and climbing up into the lap of Santa Claus and telling him that you haven't been naughty, you've been nice, and here's a list of what I want? That's what it sounds like to me. Or maybe they think it's sort of like, you know, having your picture taken with the Easter bunny and all of that kind of thing. Stop and think. Do you really want to sit down and have a conversation with Jesus. I've tried to picture that. Jesus and I sitting in a couple of old rockers on my deck, looking out toward Charlotte on a good clear day. You can see the buildings. And I realize that what would strike me is I can scarcely tell that there's a curvature in the earth's surface over that hundred miles. This is the one who made this. 
<laughs> not to mention all the stars. How many is it in our galaxy? A couple of hundred billion. And how many galaxies are they saying? It depends on when you read it. Tomorrow it'll be different because the universe keeps expanding. How many galaxies? A couple of couple hundred million? And this is the one who flung the stars into space and hollowed out the oceans in the palm of his hand. And I want to sit here and talk to him? I think it's a daunting kind of thing to glibly say, as so many of, of our popular songs say, you know, Jesus is our buddy. I don't feel that way when I go to pray. He is the creator of all this universe. The Bible says everything was made by Jesus, made for Jesus, and it hangs together through him. He is the creator of all the universe. You really want to sit down and talk with him? Not only that, I got to thinking, here I am sitting there in my rocking chair rocking, and Jesus is in the rocking chair next to me. He not only created all this, but he is the judge of all this world. He is the judge. He knows all the facts already. He knows all my sins, all the little ones and the big ones as we like to try to separate them out. He knows the past sins. He knows the present sins. He knows the ones I'm going to fall into tomorrow. He knows my sins of omission, the things I should have done but didn't do. And he knows the sins of commission, the things I shouldn't have done, but I did them anyway. And he's in the chair next to me there. That's, that's an uncomfortable feeling. I wonder what those people were thinking of. What are you going to talk about if Jesus is sitting there next to you? Everybody likes to talk about themselves. They say, you're going to just tell him about yourself? He already knows that. And you really don't want to tell him all about yourself. No way. What are you going to talk about? And especially if you're in that third of the non-believers who also want to spend an afternoon with Jesus. What are you going to talk about? Your values in his are not the same. Your hopes and dreams and desires are are not in line with, with the Lord's prayer. I have an idea that most of the folks in that survey sort of thought of an afternoon with Jesus, sort of like one of these uh, quiz, TV quiz shows, you know, where they invite somebody from the, from the audience to come down and join some celebrity or something, you know, for some kind of a game, you know. Come on down, John. Come on down, Mary, and join in the game with so-and-so, our movie star celebrity for today. That may be the way we think. But I believe that if you and I knew that we were going to spend Tuesday afternoon sitting there talking with Jesus, we might be advised to take the advice found in the story of the two little boys. They they came home from school. One of them had invited his friend home with him. And so they came running down the sidewalk. They ran up the steps right past a little old lady sitting there reading the great big black Bible. And they slammed the door and on inside they went. And the little visitor boy turned to his friend and he said, who was, that, who was that woman out there on the porch? And he said, oh, that's my grandma. She's cramming for her final exams. And you know, That might be the way we ought to prepare if we think we're fixing to have a talk with Jesus and spend an afternoon talking with him. But I I got to thinking about that survey. And then I got to thinking about people in the New Testament who actually had these conversations with Jesus, who sat down and talked with him. And you know, several important lessons just pop right out at me. 
If you think you'd like to spend an afternoon in talking with Jesus sitting there, both of you in the rockers, then think about this. As I think about these characters, you know, here's Nicodemus, here's the woman at the well, here's the Gadarene demoniac, here's Simon the Pharisee, there's Zacchaeus over there. Hey, there's the man who was by the pool for 38 years. And I got to analyzing them and their conversation with Jesus. And the first thing I realized was what I've already said, Jesus knows all about you. Hey, not even your husband or wife knows all about you, but he does. The thing about the woman at the well, for instance, in the fourth chapter of John's gospel, the Samaritan woman, we've looked at that story, I think, several Sundays ago. When you look at that story, aside from her saucy attitude, remember she said, uh, you're talking about this living water and... (laughs) How are you going to draw any water? You don't even have a bucket. Aside from that, the thing that is most striking is how she was impacted by the fact that he knew all about her. She became so flustered that she left her water pot there on the ledge of the well and ran back to town to tell the men, and they're the only ones who'd be listening to her, that she had met a man who told her everything that she had ever done. And they went out to see this man who knew all about them. Listen, if you sit down and talk to Jesus, all your secrets are going to be right there, ready to pounce on you. I look further and I realize that not only does he know all about us if we sit down and have this conversation, but he's going to turn it to spiritual things. He's going to turn it to spiritual things. You know, take the woman at the well. She won't talk about this, that, or the other, but Jesus brought it right down to spiritual things about her husband. Take Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus at night. He wants to have a conversation with him. He starts out bragging on Jesus. You're a wonderful young teacher. Everybody likes you, you know, and Jesus interrupts him and says you have to be born again. So if you think you're going to sit down and talk with Jesus about this, that, and the other, the grandkids or whatever you're going to do next week, not going to happen. He's going to turn it to spiritual things. And not that vague kind of spiritual stuff that everybody says is that you need to be spiritual these days. Whether that means staring at your navel or going out in the woods and staring at the stars. Just be spiritual. Jesus is not going to buy that. What he's going to do is talk to you about real spirituality. He's going to tell you that you must be born again. Even though Nicodemus says, how on earth can that be? He may even use with you the illustration that he used with Nicodemus, saying that he himself, Jesus, must be lifted up and crucified, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And all the people who were sick, dying, once they looked upon that bronze serpent, they were healed. He will tell you that there is only one way to be saved. And that is through faith in him. Is that what you want to spend an afternoon talking about? Whether or not you're saved? I looked at more of these stories and what I found is that not only does he know all about us and it's liable to come out in the conversation like it did with the woman at the well. And and not only is he going to talk about spiritual things, but he's going to start where we are And then he'll end up at the spiritual point. He started with a bucket at the well, remember? With Nicodemus, he started with Nicodemus being a teacher. Are you a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things? He'll start where you are. With Zacchaeus, it was, come on down, I'm supposed to have lunch with you today. He'll start where you are. 
And that leads me to ask you a question. Where are you in your spiritual life? What kind of spiritual depth do you have? My experience in a lot of churches is that a lot of people love the Bible and will fight you about it, but don't know what's in it. Do you know what's in it? Have you immersed yourself in what the Bible teaches? Have we tried to go beyond, as Paul puts it, the milk? Have we gone on to the meat of the Word? Have we applied what it means? Are we living each day in an effort to be more like Jesus? He's liable to ask you about that because he'll raise this business of spirituality and he'll want to know where you are. And he may start at some shallow place and that may be where you are but he will get on to a deeper discussion of spirituality. There's another thing. In fourth place, I I would mention this to you. It's our text passage. That's an interesting story. Here's a man invites Jesus to come and have lunch. Jesus would always go eat with anybody. Got him into a lot of trouble. Wasn't what you're supposed to do. But while he's having Dinner with this Pharisee, woman comes in. She is a woman of ill repute. And she stands there behind Jesus, who is reclining and leaning on one elbow to eat. This was the Roman way of doing things. She comes up behind him. She breaks a bottle of very expensive perfume. Equivalent to a year's wages, we're told in one of the Gospels. And she begins to pour it on his feet and mingle it with her tears and then wipe his feet with her hair. And old Simon is thinking in his heart, hmm, if this young fellow that everybody is following, he's so popular, if he really were a prophet, he'd know who she is. And he'd kick her away. Wouldn't have anything to do with her. Now remember, when you sit and talk to Jesus, that's another one of those things that can get really sticky. He's going to know your thoughts. And Jesus, knowing what this man is thinking, answers him. Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. And poor Simon just falls right into the pit say on master and Jesus did you've been a mighty poor host you haven't even done that which ordinary host would do you didn't anoint my head with oil but she's not ceased to to anoint my feet you didn't wash my feet when I came in but she's been washing them you didn't even do what ordinary hosts do I say to you folks, you know, when I think about sitting there having an afternoon in conversation with Jesus, I think about the fact that he's liable to criticize me. He's liable to say, Earl, you know you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have thought that way. You're supposed to be trying to follow me. And he's liable to criticize you too. You sure you want to sit down and have an afternoon of conversation with the creator, the judge, the one who made us, who knows all about us, who's going to be talking about spiritual things and who's going to want to know where we are spiritually? Well, one other thing I noticed about most of these conversations that Jesus had with people, before it was over, he said an encouraging word usually. An invitation to follow, to change your way of life. You're prepared for that if you spend an afternoon talking with him? Neither do I condemn you, he said. Go and sin no more. For this one too, he said, after Zacchaeus came down from the tree, this one whom you charge with stealing from you, he too 
is a son of Abraham. Go back home to the demoniac. Tell your friends what God has done for you. Are you sure you want to spend an afternoon with Jesus? What would you say? I have an advantage over you because I've been thinking about it. What would I say? I think if we were both sitting there on my deck, I would first of all tell him that I love him and that I want to be loyal and that I thank you, Lord, for knowing my heart. For even when I cannot live up to what I want to do, you know my heart. And it is turned toward you. I would praise him for his goodness. I would say, Lord, every day I look back in my life and I see how you have been there and how you have blessed me. You have been good beyond my deserving. I'd talk to him about my friends and some of you would come up during this time. I'd talk about my friends who have illnesses, my friends who are going through a dark time. I'd talk about some friends whose deepest desires are hanging in the balance and they may or may not be achieved. And I would, would ask him for his blessing on all these people. I'd ask him for help. I would ask him for guidance on how during the time I'm with you, I can be of most help in carrying out his will in your life and in the life of the church as a whole. And then I would ask him to forgive my sins. I wouldn't have to confess them because he already knows them. And I'd ask him to, you know, dust me off, Lord, set me on my feet again. And head me toward the holy city. But you know, I speak of spending an afternoon in conversation with Jesus. But you don't have to wait till you get an invitation to spend an afternoon with him. Because we're just talking about prayer, aren't we? That's exactly what we're talking about. It's one of the most serious things you'll ever do, isn't it? Is to talk with the eternal creator. You can do it. You can do it even here. You can do it even now. And indeed, we're going to sing a hymn of commitment in just a moment. And every one of us needs to realize that we're in the presence of God Almighty. Maybe you need to ask him for forgiveness, for guidance. Maybe you need to come and kneel and pray. Maybe you need to make a public decision of your commitment to him by becoming a member of this church. But it is a time to be in his presence. So let's stand as we turn in our hymnals to our hymn of commitment and sing together. Hymn number 411. So sweet to try.
We thank you for being with us in worship today. And Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for again for allowing us to be in your house today and for this time of worship. Lord, we just pray that we'll take what we've heard here today and apply these words to our lives and go out and share this with others. Lord, we just pray that you'll please let us have a safe afternoon and just bring us back next time. All the things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mm-hmm.